to welcome Sheila along. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you, Bill. Quite honestly, I don't know if we need a talk this morning. It's all been said and beautifully. Um, but I am struck by the synchronicity of that Unity magazine, which was due in September and October, arriving this month while we're doing The Power of Judgment. And much of what has been said and reviewed by Diane is actually the substance of my talk. So I hope that you won't get bored listening to it. Anyway, reviewing our perspectives. Charles Fillmore said the perceiving power of the mind is linked with the power to shape substance. So exactly how all of us perceive anything and what we think about it has enormous significance in the cosmic field. This is a sober, this is a sobering realization. Gary Simmons wrote a definitive book called The Eye of the Storm, which I would wholeheartedly recommend to anyone who wants to understand how our thoughts can mislead us and how we can lift ourselves out of limited and damaged thinking patterns. Your perception is your reality. And Simmons makes the point that we must use principle to compensate for misperception. Quantum physicists assert that in any given moment, infinite possibilities are present. However, the moment we act as if something is so, the universe of infinite possibilities collapses into one inevitable happenstance. When you look at something and say, this is what it is, you are pouring your creative energy, your attention and awareness into that specific perception. The moment your awareness locks on to one possibility, all other universe's possibilities collapse. And that is why it is so important not to give power to your perceptions as if they accurately describe what is going on. And when you realize that your perception is incomplete and mediated by your need to feel safe and okay, you will pause before drawing any concrete conclusions. The times we live in seem to demand that we all make different types of judgments on just about everything, sometimes instantly. Socially, we may be thought ignorant or irresponsible by our peers if we do not have definite opinions. Our culture seems to expect this of us. The idea is that as educated and responsible voters in a democracy, it is our duty to choose which issues are the most important to us and then to vote accordingly at election time. We are encouraged into polarized opinions, which also leave us wide open to manipulation from propaganda that makes strong appeal to our lesser emotions. Under these circumstances, it is difficult to be exercising the finer aspects of our judgment faculty in a way that best supports our divine identity. It is not even very helpful in honoring the best human thought processes, but it's where we seem to stand at this stage in our collective development. Interestingly, Charles Fillmore says the spiritual faculty of judgment which is the power to evaluate and discriminate between one thing and another, does not even begin to come into play until we become aware of divine ideas. Then, only after we have discovered spiritual truth, are we able to exercise this faculty of judgment properly and in the way that Fillmore intended this term to be understood. And then our decisions are based on very different criteria. These are extraordinary times, but I have a feeling each generation says the same thing. There is always something going on in the world that has to be grappled with, and the spiritual challenges are likely to be exactly the same for every generation. 
At the moment, the intensity of the long months of suppressed panic last year, when many crouched like hunted animals, seems to have been transformed into the desire to criticize every decision and tear other people apart. The collector shadow of fear has emerged and is sniffing out what is to be devoured with the savagery of pit bulls. This is not a pretty side of human nature. It has been a roller coaster ride over the last few months, and there have been some appalling things in the news bulletins. True, we can tune out completely, bury our heads in the sand and become a recluse. We can ignore what is going on in the outside world. But I have chosen to stay in touch with events so that I understand what is happening at the human level. And I am also attempting to keep a high watch simply because I believe that is what we are here on earth to do. Why incarnate otherwise? If not to help lift the lamp of divine light and shine it on human consciousness. And it all begins with our own perspectives. We hold opinions on many things. We have multiple biases and they all need to be carefully sorted and identified. What we call our ego self is a conglomerate of conscious and unconscious thoughts, feelings, inherited prejudices, opinions, loyalties, traditions, habits, and agreements. We have a huge mix of attributes from past and present and misperceptions that confuse and limit us, unless that is, we discover the world of transpersonal knowing, the intuition of spirit and decree it otherwise. I take responsibility in maintaining my hold on principle and divine ideas, but have been quite challenged recently in my sense of tolerance. The currents of emotion have been strong as they usually are when others believe so passionately in something that we may assess quite differently. At the human level, the very definiteness of the one position seems to generate a defensive reaction of equal and opposite force in the other. This leading to all sorts of struggle and inner conflicts and outer debates. It is just too easy to be dropped down, sorry, to be dragged down emotionally without the awareness of how to avoid this happening. Everyone here is likely to know there is another way. We can find spiritual support within. We can do far better than relying solely on our human judgments to guide us. But it all rests on our concept of self-identity and our sense of what our true purpose in being here is. And who do we desire to be in this world? Adhering to the spiritual path, will calm the waters and prevent further escalation of any type of problem. We can know we do not need to be pushed into the position of either or type thinking that keeps us constrained within rigid mindsets. There is another way. We know we grow in wisdom when we seek direction from spirit. So if we are genuine, in our intention to remain free and fluid in our perceptions, we can turn from the outer focus back to the inner self, where we can examine any part we might like to play to make things better in the larger social world. We can monitor our own reactions and manage our feelings by focusing on divine ideas and spirit's promise of eternal good. Fortunately, I know what works for me, I can detect more and more easily if I'm not in the place I want to be. I check in regularly to see whether I'm feeling expanded or contracted. We all have psychophysiological responses and can train ourselves to read these and learn from them. We may need to concentrate for a while and to ask searching questions before we know what those sensations mean. The point is that they are there to tell us something. Something has been overlooked and that we need to acknowledge it and change if necessary. For example, 
we might find we have been thinking critical thoughts without realizing it. These thoughts have a hard and acid quality that disturbs our peace of mind. Then we should get to work immediately to change them before any damage is done to ourselves. When we change our outlook, we feel comfortable again. Our bodies tell us so. Hard thoughts are always a sign of being drawn down in consciousness. So this is the crucial moment to stand back and spend as much time as we need to, to identify the disturbing thought and adjust it in our thinking. When we have restored our perspective to where we want it to be, a corresponding change in our bodily awareness will tell us we have succeeded. This works every time. When we find our spiritual center again, we can hold to higher ground and problems and discordant energies no longer overwhelm us. Like you, I have been hearing the news. You may have felt the same frustration of listening over and over to slanted commentary and opinions with which you simply do not agree. You may think things have been badly handled and each of us may hold quite different views of how these things could be handled better. We are continually challenged to control our own reactions. So this is an opportune time for us to be reviewing our personal perspectives. Because as Charles Fillmore points out, the prevailing tendency of judgment is towards caution, fearfulness, criticism and condemnation. And we can easily observe all these things in our current social and political arena. The media is fueled by criticism and condemnation of all kinds. And it will continue to be this way for as long as we continue to allow it. And for as long as we make decisions from merely human reactions to outer conditions. In such a climate, the jaws of condemnation open easily and snap shut again with the same finality, taking no prisoners, no matter the consequence to those involved or the institutions. Moral perfectionism and self-righteousness only amplify hypocrisy and intolerance. They cruelly divide us, reducing the roles we play to either that of victim or of bully. I am reminded that the dangerous energies and ugly practices of scapegoating and witch hunting can resurface at any time. Unfortunately, we must accept that under the right provocation, we are all capable of these imperfections. But it is far worse if we are unaware of this weakness. These human tendencies can lie dormant only to be called out at the right time by the piously self-righteous, many of whom operate under, under a cloak of altruism and some form of puritanism. Hitler started that way. Again, we have witnessed a drive for controlling what others should be allowed to think, which results in the blatant intimidation of those who think differently. This is a regressive step in our culture, comparable to the practice of book burning, which seems suddenly to have resurfaced. How has all this come about? Where is mercy, humanity, compassion? We know none of us are perfect in our human identity and we do not serve the evolution of human consciousness by pretending otherwise. Most of us know of a higher and better more ideal nature, where we all have access to the direction and guidance of spirit from Christ consciousness. We only have to tune in. If it becomes our life purpose to promote spiritual understanding, we must uphold this perspective in our behavior towards one another as we respect the I am of our own being. Carl Jung made the following observations. If people can be educated to see the shadow side of their nature clearly, it may be hoped that they will also learn to understand and love their fellow men better. 
A little less hypocrisy and a little more self-knowledge can only have good results in respect of our neighbor. For we are all too prone to transfer to our fellows the injustice and violence we afflict upon our own natures. Which of us has not beaten ourselves up for weakness and past mistakes? But we must know that self-condemnation is very damaging and unhelpful in our spiritual growth because it creates shame and more separation from the divine within. In unity, we know we are responsible for our feelings and need to learn how to monitor our thoughts that create them. In fact, the degree to which we do develop this skill will determine the degree to which we will be able to fulfill our divine purpose in the practice of the Christ principles. I have always remembered Charles Fillmore's chapter on judgment and justice in Christian healing, where he writes, spiritual truth is ready at all times to give judgment and justice. And when justice and love meet at the heart center, there are balance, poise and righteousness. But, but when judgment is divorced from love and works from the head alone, there goes forth the human cry for justice. We need to be aware of this because in his mere human judgment, we are hard and heartless. We deal out punishment without consideration of motive, cause and justice goes astray. Judge not that ye be not judged, said Jesus. Fillmore concludes, the habit of judging others, even in the most insignificant matters of daily life must be discontinued. Because he says, in our ignorance, we are creating thought forces that will react upon us. Whatever thought we send out will come back to us. A man may be just in all his dealings, yet if he condemns others for their injustice, that thought action will bring him into unjust conditions. So it is not safe to judge except in the absolute, he says. This is the stand that everyone must take, resting judgment of others in the absolute. In Atom Smashing Power of the Mind, Fillmore adds, in spiritual understanding, we know that all the forces of the body are directed by thought and that they work in a constructive or a destructive way according to the character of the thoughts. In Christian healing, he declares, the liver seems to be connected with mental discrimination. And whenever man gets very active along the lines of judgment, especially where con condemnation enters in, there is a disturbance of some kind in that part of the organism or body. And whatever darkness, the understanding interferes in some way with the purifying. Sorry, whatever darkens the understanding interferes in some way with the purifying processes of the organism, your body. And finally, listen to this important message. Observing the conditions that exist in the world, the just man would have them righted according to what he perceives to be equitable law. But unless such a one has spiritual understanding, he is very likely to bring on himself physical disabilities in his efforts to reform other men. If his feelings come to a point of righteous indignation and he boils with anger over the evils of the world, he will cook the corpuscles of his blood and that, of course, will have lasting consequences for our health. So the spiritual advice universally is to pull back and respect the autonomy of another person's psychic space and not to judge from a human perspective. And since I need an ending for this talk, I fiddled with an acronym for the word respect as an antidote for condemnation because without that basic perspective of respect, 
much harm will be done. The acronym might well be improved, but I will share it with you at this stage anyway. R is to remember we are response-able for our thoughts. Remember to step back when we are activated and reflect upon our resistance. E is to evaluate what is in our energy field. Where does ego stand? Examine entrenched ideas, expand and enlarge our vision. S is to surrender negative thoughts and accusations. Sound out the deeper truth of spirit. P is to pivot to possibility, presence and power. What is our divine purpose and identity? Adopt the perspective of peace and wholeness. E is to engage your heart and soften hard thoughts. Extend empathy and explore the field. What divine ideas have now emerged? C is to contribute from Christ Center. Centeredness gives power and access to choice. Cancel competition and create a safe space for everyone. And T is for trust that this too shall pass. Turn things over. Everything material is transient. Trust in divine truth. Charles Fillmore believed all our good thoughts minister to us in days of despondency and discouragement. Every thought of goodness makes a place, a form, and sets up a friendly habit in the mind that is permanent, and that in your time of need will minister to you. Thus, you reap the benefit of all the good you have ever done or thought the power of your blessings. And in 500 BCE, Lao Tzu said, whoever is soft and yielding is the disciple of life. Namaste. Thank you, Sheila. Namaste. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means to me. Well done. Food for thought, and you can see that, of course, uh, once Wayne puts that up on our website. So uh, there's a lot there to take in. So I'll enjoy doing that uh, as the week goes on. Well, we did have.